a lot of women come to us for help and support and guidance and but so often I feel like I'm changed as a person because of them because of their story because of the way that I see God working in their story this type of work is hard like it's wearing even eight years later there's still days that I go home and I'll cry because it's just a lot of sadness and a lot of heartbreak think about the darkest place in your life think about the hardest time in your life the hardest season of your life and imagine going that alone imagine having to do that without knowing God without um, having support without having financial resources and the question I was would ask is what would you want so when I think about our clients they want to feel loved they want to know they are loved they want to know that they are cared for they want to know that they are important that they're worthy I mean so many walk in and they their worth is just dirt on the floor I mean it's they've just been shut down so many times what keeps me coming back is that I'm always reminded that God has set me here for a purpose. And as hard as it is sometimes to walk in these doors and know that there are five women that are on the schedule that are all set on abortion that I'm gonna have to see today, I mean, it's overwhelming sometimes. But then I step back and I say, all right, God, you've brought me here. You've placed me in this position. I've given you my word that I'm going to be your hands and feet here and I'm going to be open to what you have in store for me. And that's what I do and that's what I'm here for. I love getting to love women and love them where they're at. We are a ministry that we pride ourselves in saying we are pro-women. We want these women to come in and we want them to not just hear our words, but we want them to experience that love of Jesus. We want to bring the love of Christ firsthand to them because a lot of them haven't experienced that. To have centers like us to come alongside them to remind them that they have more choices than abortion, that there's more hope out there, that they matter, that they're worthy of having hope, that they're worthy of having love, that they're worthy of having a future that's bright. By us being able to open more centers, I mean, we can just spread that light farther and farther. Well, it's the last Sunday before Christmas. As Paige said, kind of hard to believe, but here we are. So I thought we might start with a little bit of fun this morning. You up for a little bit of fun? Oh, maybe. We'll see. I want to give you a, a little cultural Christmas IQ test. So I'm going to ask you some very important questions to see if you know the very important answers. The first category is going to be Christmas movies. According to a recent poll, the top five most popular Christmas movies in America are, and you don't have to guess these, but let me just see how close you come. What's number one? Right, Home Alone, number one. <laughs> Second, Going Back in Time, It's a Wonderful Life. You can find lots of different lists, but this is the one I found. Number three, Elf. Number four, nope, A Christmas Story. Number five, Die Hard. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Some of you guys do think that's a Christmas movie. But number five was How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Now, 
Personally, I'm a little upset that my, one of my favorites, the Santa Claus, didn't make the top five, right? Anybody, any Santa Claus fans out there? But now, now let me test your knowledge about these cinematic cultural icons. So give yourself one point for each correct answer, all right? You have to keep it yourself. I'm not going to keep it for all of you. Here we go. Question number one. In what year was Home Alone made? A, 1990. B, 1942. C, 2001. A, 1990. That should make some of you feel old. <laughs> Secondly, what was the name of the family in Home Alone? A, the Joneses. B, the McAllisters. C, the Frasers. <laughs> v, the McAllisters. Who wrote the original story of How the Grinch Stole Christmas? A, Charles Dickens. <laughs> B, C.S. Lewis. Do not tell Jeff that I said that. <laughs> or C, Dr. Seuss. The answer is? Okay, bonus question. What was Dr. Seuss's real name? Theodore. Right, Theodore. Say, is it pronounced Geisel? Geisel? Theodore Geisel. Double bonus. What was the name of the Grinch's dog? Max. Max. Excellent. Give yourself a point. Give yourself two points if you knew that. <laughs> All right. In the classic It's a Wonderful Life, what is the lead character's name? George, George Bailey. Played by Jimmy Stewart. Very good. Bonus, what was George's younger brother's name? Harry. Well, we have a lot of people watch too many movies. Okay. Okay. In A Christmas Story, what's the central character's name? Ralphie. And what does Ralphie want most for Christmas? Now, you have to get this exactly right. Okay. An official Red Rider carbine action, 200 range... Model air rifle, right? Okay, second category, really quickly, Christmas music. What's the best-selling Christmas single record of all time? A single. A, Jingle Bells, written by James Pierpont in 1857, or B, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, written by somebody named Elmo and Patsy, or C, White Christmas. White Christmas, Bing Crosby, 50 million sold worldwide. Michael Bluebelly may be catching up, but 50 million. What's the top-selling Christmas album of all time? This is a surprise. Elvis Presley, Christmas album from 1957. All right? And this is, these are just answers I found. I might be wrong, but these are the ones I found. And lastly, what is the world's favorite Christmas song of all time? According to Time Magazine, the answer is Silent Night, composed by Franz Gruber in 1818. So how'd you do? There were like 12 possible points. Anybody get them all? You got them all? You watch too many movies, like I said. But congratulations. Give yourself a prize when you get home. I don't have any here today. We're in a series now called Songs of Advent, wrapping it up. Uh, and we've been looking at some of the great Christmas hymns or Christmas carols that we sing year after year to see what they can teach us about the great story. Uh, we've, so far, we've looked at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We looked at Come Now, Long Expected Jesus. Last week, we looked at Joy to the World. And this week, as I was preparing, I found a, a quote from a pastor who I don't know who he was, but he said, carols, I mean, these hymns we sing uh, every year, Carols help us fight the soul-damaging practice of making stupendous things dull. It's a great quote. Now, I don't think we're in danger of uh, making Christmas dull by any means, but I do think sometimes uh, we're in danger of turning Christmas into a Hallmark movie instead of the story that's really in front of us. Today we're looking at Hark the Herald Angels Sing, written by Charles Wesley. You may remember that we've already looked at one hymn, written by Charles Wesley, Come Now Long Expected Jesus. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. You might also remember that Wesley was the youngest son and 18th child of the somewhat prolific Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Imagine Christmas morning at the Wesley household. Hmm? He was the youngest of 18. Uh, you may also be more familiar with his older brother, John, who's known as the father of Methodism. But Charles is considered by many to be one of the greatest hymn writers of all time. Wrote over 6,000 hymns in his lifetime, including many that we still sing today in worship. He wrote the lyrics of this carol in 1739, and originally it had 10 verses. We only sing three of them today. The lyrics were then slightly modified by another preacher named uh, George Whitfield in 1753, and the music came almost 100 years later, actually a little more than 100 years later, in 1840 from Felix Mendelssohn. So I'm going to read through the lyrics again. I want you to listen to them 
as if you're listening to um, not a song that you sing all the time, but listening to a theological um, treatise. Listen to the words. Hark, the herald angels sing. Now, a few words about this line. Wesley's original opening to the hymn was, Hark, how all the welkin rings. Glory to the King of Kings. Now, how many of you know what welkin means? That's why it was eventually changed. It's an old word that means the vault of heaven, uh, and what we would call the cosmos, the in totality of the inhabited universe from top to bottom, giving vocal and musical praise to Jesus. So it's a great word. Uh, Whitfield later simplified the line to hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king to make it easier to sing and to understand. Now, hark is a word we don't use much anymore either. It just means to hearken to or to listen to to pay attention to something that's extremely important. And a herald was the messenger of a king. So, hark, the herald angels sing. Now, what's the message that the messengers of the king bring us to listen to that we should pay attention to? Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Verse 2, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Now I hope you notice that like the other hymns we've studied, this is a kind of Christological tour de force, a Christological masterpiece about who Jesus is and what he's done. Clearly, this hymn is based on the familiar words of Luke chapter 2. So let's see how Luke tells the story. Luke 2, beginning in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So three things I want to pull out of this great hymn. First, the glory of the king, and then the birth of the king, and then the work of the king. First, the glory of the king. When my brothers and I were young, um, we collected trophies, like um, many kids do, like uh, many people do. Uh, most of the trophies we got were for sports, but not all of them, and it didn't really matter what the trophy was for. We just liked to collect trophies. I, in fact, I once got a trophy for memorizing Bible verses. I did. Uh, our church had a program for kids called Bible Memory Association, and if you completed all five levels, which took five years, the carrot at the end of the five years for me was you, you, you could get a trophy. And so for that fifth year, I had to memorize 13 verses every week and recite them Sunday afternoon. And that was when I first realized I could memorize things, so I wouldn't start till an hour ahead of time and I could memorize those. Secondly, that's how I learned, started to learn God's Word. Now, my motivation was not the beauty and power and truth of God's word. It was to get that trophy, and it took me five years. I finally got the trophy. It's this little plastic thing. I was so disappointed. But I still remember some of those verses. So I think we collect trophies because they're, they're symbols of achievement and respect. They're sort of uh, tangible glory. A trophy sort of translated the temporary glory of achievement on the athletic field or memorizing verses into some sort of permanent and tangible representation of glory. So if you wonder, some of you ladies wonder why your husband still keeps some of his trophies, that's why. They're tangible glory. But that's not the kind of glory we're talking about here in this story. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. In fact, that's the closing line of all three stanzas we sing today. Glory to the newborn king. And they come straight from Luke chapter 2. 
Luke says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, what, what I want you to see here is that this is a different kind of glory. This is not um, the faded glory of a trophy on a shelf. It reminds us of a great accomplishment in years gone by. No, this is the glory of the Lord, the glory of God that caused these shepherds to be terrified. Literally, the Greek is, they feared with great fear. I imagine they may have fallen, faces down in the mud, overwhelmed with the fear that whatever this was might consume them or destroy them. When I was about a junior in high school or so, I, was, I used to walk home from, from my school. It was about three quarters of a mile. As I walked home one day, as I was approaching maybe I don't know, a couple, couple hundred yards from our house, I began to sort of, I was in a sort of a daydream, carrying my books, and I was just, somehow the thought came to me, what, what would I do if I came upon our home, and um, our home was being attacked by an evil intruder with, with malicious intent? What would I do? I'm 16 years old, you know, I'm, I'm a man, uh, and, and I was imagining, <laughs> sort of, I was imagining that I would, uh, I would fight. I would, I would defend our home. I would defend my younger brothers, my mom. I would fight even to the death. What I did not know is that my father had gotten home early from work that day, and he saw me coming before I saw him. And so he waited on our front porch, and as I walked around the corner of our house, thinking these heroic thoughts, he was waiting for me. And just as I turned the corner, he was standing on the porch, and he went, ah, like that. I have no idea why he did that. But I threw my books in the air, and I fell flat on my back, just completely terrified. <laughs> my dad thought that was funny. I think that's the kind of fear that the glory of the Lord may have created in these shepherds. So what is glory? In our culture, we think of glory as something that we accomplish, like winning the Super Bowl. You know, um, remember the days when we should think about the bears. Well, no, I'm sorry. Or, or maybe fame and celebrity, or maybe even something breathtakingly beautiful, like people post pictures on Facebook of a, of a glorious sunset or a glorious sunrise. And that's close, but those are just reflections of glory, the sort of postcards of glory. The New Testament word is doxa, from which we get our word doxology. And the Old Testament word was a Hebrew word called uh, kabod. And it carried the meaning of respect and honor and majesty, but also a kind of heaviness or weightiness. And throughout the Old Testament, the glory of God is understood as a powerful and terrifying thing. In Exodus 33, we read this curious story, verse 18, when Moses said, now show me your glory. He's talking to God. Show me your glory, your kavod. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, Yahweh, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion, but... He said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And throughout the Old Testament, we see God's uh, glory manifested, uh, for example, in the pillar of fire at night and in the pillar of smoke by day. In Leviticus 10, there are two sons of the high priest, uh, two guys named Nadab and Abihu, who offer the Bible says, strange fire before the Lord. In other words, they're sort of playing around frivolously with worship before a holy God. And it says, fire burned out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them on the spot. God's glory is a byproduct of his holiness. And this is the God that we worship every Sunday. Annie Dillard, a writer, has this passage. She says, Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we blithely invoke? We are like children playing on the floor with our chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT on a Sunday morning. It's madness to wear straw or velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews or to our chairs. And this is the glory revealed in the newborn king. In the book of Hebrews, we read, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. And then the Son is the radiance of God's glory 
and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So, we have an angel, a herald of the king, announcing that a child is born and the glory of God erupts in a lonely field outside a Middle Eastern village. So how does the glory of God reveal itself? Wesley writes, Peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled, joyful, all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies with the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. God's glory is revealed in a child born to be king. God's glory is manifested in peace and mercy. God's glory manifested in this, God and sinners reconciled. Years ago, um, I got a call in my office at South Street Campus, and the man on the other end said he needed to talk to me about something, but it was so important, he said, that he couldn't do it over the phone, but I please come to where he lived. And so I think that day or the next day, I went to his home, and he eventually, with um, great uh, trepidation, confessed to me that years earlier in his life, he had committed, in his mind, a sin so heinous that even though he was a Christian and a believer in Christ, he feared it would keep him out of heaven when he died. And so we talked about that. And I was able to say to him, no, God and sinners reconciled. This is the good news. This is why Christ came. This is what the, the gift he gives us. But how is it accomplished? Christ is born in Bethlehem. And notice, the response to glory is no longer fear, but joy. Luke writes, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. So the, 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 the shepherds were terrified. The angel says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy because a Savior has been born to you. God and sinners reconciled. Secondly, we see in this hymn the birth of the king. The birth of the king. That's the glory of the king. This is the birth of the king. Our third son, uh, Micah, was born in the usual way, but because um, the labor process was rather drawn out, he came to us looking like he'd been through a 15-round uh, prize fight. Healthy, but a little beat up. So in those days, uh, there wasn't digital photography, so a couple days after we brought him home, I had to go back to the hospital and pick up his birth photos that they take right after the child was born. So I went back to, and went to the front desk, and there was a volunteer there, this really sweet-looking, grandmotherly-looking lady who was volunteering at the desk. And I said, I've come to pick, pick up my son's um, birth pictures. She said, what's his name? I gave her the name. She said, well, let's, let's, let's. And she, she was flipping through these folders. She came to his name. She says, oh, here he is. Let's take a look. And she opened up the, she opened up the, the picture. She went, oh, my. <laughs> and this is the picture she saw. I know. He, he got better looking after that. <laughs> it was a little bit of an awkward moment, so I said, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. She was embarrassed. I said, it's okay. You know, he, he's doing fine now. His Wesley writes, Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Here's how Luke says it, and this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in the manger. I want you to see three things here. First, the miracle of his birth. The miracle of his birth, offspring of the virgin's womb. Years ago, um, late, no, late night talk show legend Larry King, who just died earlier this year in January, uh, who had interviewed nearly every famous person in the uh, late 20th century, was asked himself a question. The interviewer asked him if he could interview anyone from history, who would it be and why? And Larry King said without hesitation, I would interview Jesus of Nazareth, and I would ask him if he was indeed born of a virgin because that, the answer to that question would define all of history, he said. And Larry King was right. The virgin birth did and does define all history. Some think of this as a sort of a mythological add-on to the whole nativity story that no one really believes in the virgin birth. I mean, that's impossible. Here's the thing. If human beings could figure out the technology, which 
we did back in 1978 with the birth of Louise Brown, the world's first, first so-called test tube baby, then certainly the God of the universe who created life itself could figure out the technology. The claim of virgin birth is not only true, but must be true if the gospel is to be true. Must be true if the gospel is to have power. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. The second thing we need to see is the humility of his birth. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Anyone who's been even remotely associated with the process of human birth knows that humility is a really kind word to use for the process of a human being being born. Right? Not only is there the blood, sweat, and tears of labor, of course, which I only went through from a distance watching, but beyond that, there's, the, there's hardly any creature in all of nature more vulnerable than a newborn human being. Paul says it this way in Philippians 2. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The king of heaven, born to an unwed and likely teenage mother, laid in an animal's feeding trough for the first night of his earthly life. Thirdly, we need to see the power of his birth. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, God with us. The Apostle John writes it this way, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, glories of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, it's easy for us to look around uh, in our world and see the suffering and pain all around us, and it's easy to see the suffering and difficulty that might be in our own world. But the great good news is that the Word became flesh, that God has not left us alone in the sin and darkness and pain of this world. He came into this world to walk in it and to live in it, uh, to born, be born of a woman uh, under unimaginably hurt, humble circumstances, that he would know the hunger and weariness and pain that you and I each know. This is the power of his birth. God revealed his glory in flesh of all things. Noted historian named Kenneth Scott Lauderette writes this, Jesus has had more effect on the history of mankind than any other person who ever existed. Nobody has had the influence Jesus Christ of Nazareth has had. To explain him is impossible. To ignore him is disastrous. To reject him is fatal. My speech is too limited to describe him, my mind too small to comprehend him, and my heart too inadequate to fully contain this one whose name is Jesus. The King of glory was born in flesh in order to accomplish a specific work. And that leads us to the third point today, the work of the king. Luke continues the great story. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, Caesar Augustus was the Roman emperor, which is another word for king. Uh, and what is the work of a king? What's the work of Caesar? Well, we know that he founded the Roman Empire that lasted 1,400 years. We know that Caesar had the power to issue decrees, that is, laws. Caesar had the power to levy taxes in order to fund what's called the Pax Romana. We know Caesar conquered and he ruled. I mean, that's what kings do, right? We think of kings as having ultimate power and authority, coercive power and authority. We think of kings as living in castles far removed from their subjects. We think of kings as being ensconced in opulence and wealth while their subjects grovel in the mud for their very existence, but not the king we celebrate today. Wesley writes, Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Mild he lays his glory by. For what? To do what? Three lines. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark. The herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Just those three lines. Born that man no more may die. 
In John chapter 11, just prior to the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And most of you will recognize that verse as a verse we usually read close to Easter time because it talks about resurrection. But there can be no resurrection without incarnation because there is no death without first there being a birth. John Piper, theologian and pastor, in his rather stark language writes, the incarnation is the preparation of nerve endings for the nails that would be hammered into his hands and feet. The incarnation is the preparation of a brow for thorns to be pressed through. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. In 1 Peter we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Now you might be thinking, Time out, Pastor Brian. Um, it's Christmas time. Why are you talking about death and resurrection? Well, here's the reason. Glory. Glory. We put up our trees this time of the year. We string the lights. We wrap the gifts. We sing the songs. We bake the cookies. We watch the movies. And it's all good. It's all good. But then, on December 26th, or shortly thereafter, it all goes back in the box, doesn't it? All goes back in the attic. All goes down to the basement. A lot of the trash goes out. And the real world comes back into view. Full view. Pandemic is going on. Back to work, back to school, back to stress, watching bad Bears games. <laughs> a week ago Saturday night, a week ago last night, I led a funeral for a family that lost their son, brother, and uncle, 51 years old, sudden and unexpected. Next week on Wednesday, the 29th, I have another funeral, this one for an 89-year-old longtime member of Chapel Street, a friend named Gene Peterson. Friday night, I was on call chaplain at Delnor Hospital. I got a call for a lady who had a massive stroke. I did not know her or her family. And they just told her family that she would not recover. Such a hard time. It's Christmas season. Such a hard time for a family to go through a loss and to go through grief. It's a time to be together and to celebrate, not to grieve. But, listen, this is why the message of this hymn matters. A child has been born born to raise the sons of earth, born to give us second birth, the glory of God turned loose in the world, God and sinners reconciled. And so may all nations, and may all heaven and earth, and may we together join in singing the great chorus, glory to the newborn king. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord God, thank you today for your word, and thank you for the truth that we celebrate yet again today. Thank you for this nearly 300-year-old hymn that lifts our hearts and minds to behold your glory. And may we worship you not only for your coming to us in great humility, but may we worship you for your promise of new birth, for your promise of manifest glory. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for that. Receive now the benediction. And we go now in the name of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to him be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority, both now and forever. Amen. Have a great day.